<laughs> and so we just before starting and before we remove ourselves from the spotlight, um, just want to give a standing ovation and or oh, if you cannot stand up, a sitting ovation uh, to our host uh, today. And uh, Michael Punit, do you want to do the introduction? And you can use the chat to say hello and do your ovation. Sure. I think we, we can start maybe in like one or two minutes more. We'll just wait for a few of the participants to join. It's still 628 in my machine actually. So let me I don't see the chat uh, moving a lot. Please do innovation. Like you can just do ah. Hey. Hello. I have done in chat also. Hello. There's no way of emoting on the chat also, actually. Or is there one? I don't think Zoom chat supports emoticons, uh, but it's been a while since so I've tried. <laughs> Hello world. <laughs> nice. I guess we can start now. It's like six forty on my watch. Um, we can. Let me see if I can share my screen. Uh, yeah. Progress. Just a minute, guys. Okay, uh, first of all, like, is my screen visible, guys? Yep. Okay, sure. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Jug. Uh, so, uh, first of all, hope everyone is doing fine wherever they are in this part of the world and in the other part of the world, like the Europe and the Americas. So, welcome to the Jug. And today we have uh, Pratik with us. Uh, he's a Java champion. And he has also published a lot of books on Java and the related technologies. Uh, currently, he works at Azul. And as part of uh, the Fuji tour, uh, they are actually uh, mentioning about, I mean, they are doing a, some sort of a jug tour across the world. And today we have one of the more very interesting topics in place. It's about Java 17, which has been uh, recently launched. And all of us are like quite excited about what's there in Java 17, and it's gonna be the long-term support for uh, uh, from the Java side. So uh, welcome, Pratik. Happy to have you here. Uh, over to you uh, with regards to the presentation. Okay. Thank you, Puneet, for the lovely introduction. Let me go and share my screen so that you can see the presentation, and uh, we'll just go ahead and get started. Uh, I will say about this presentation, if you have a question, uh, especially as we're looking at any of the code examples or any of the you know, technical details or whatever, uh, please feel free to ask those questions. Uh, and I will do my best to keep an eye on the chat um, to answer those. Uh, or you can uh, just unmute yourself and also ask the question. So I'm happy to take questions as we walk through this. But uh, we've already done the introduction, so uh, I will skip this slide. Uh, if you want to reach out after the presentation, my Twitter handle is at the bottom. You can send me a direct message and we can uh, continue the discussion there uh, after this presentation. And uh, this is the wrong URL, but let me get to it. There we go. So uh, Azul is giving away a $50 Lazada e-gift card. So if you are in uh, Singapore, uh, please go and um, do a quick scan of this. I'm trying to find the chat. Where's the chat for? Uh, there's so many different ways to do this. Hold on. There we go. I thought I had the chat open. There we go. Okay. So let me just put the URL uh, directly in the chat so you can uh, enter to win the gift card uh, with the URL that I just pasted into the Zoom chat, or you can just scan this. And I'll show it again at the end of this presentation also, All right? And uh, as Puneet mentioned, I work for Azul. So we have two different uh, JVM builds for various different versions of Java, which are drop-in replacements. There's Azul OpenJDK builds, 
uh, which are free and support available. And of course, our high performance JVM called Platform Prime. Uh, so check that out. We like to think it's the best JVM in the galaxy. Um, in the Java Renaissance test suite, it beats OpenJDK by 37%, uh, which is not a small number, of course. And of course, it's a drop-in replacement for the JDK, uh, and there's no code changes. So uh, one other thing, as uh, Puneet mentioned, this is part of the Fuji tour. So go check out Fuji.io. This is a great website with lots of content written by folks in the community. Uh, and you can also write content for Fuji. So it's definitely worth checking out. Uh, if you just want to get up to date on some of the new developments in the Java space and surrounding ecosystem, or if you want to write an article, it's a good place to go and publish your content, especially if you don't have your own blog. It's open and uh, available to anybody in the community. All right, with that said, let's get started with the actual presentation. Uh, so again, if you have questions as I'm going through this, I'm happy to take them. The best time to ask a question is when you have it. You don't have to wait till the end or anything like that. Uh, and what we're going to do is this is broken up into three rough parts. Uh, I'm going to spend a few minutes just talking about the Java release cadence, because I think a lot of developers uh, are not necessarily confused about it, but they may just not be aware of some of the uh, details around how Java releases are done today. And of course, we'll talk about all the features from uh, Java 12 to 17 that have accumulated over the last three years between the long-term support releases. And of course, we'll look at some code examples. Okay, so first let's talk about the Java release cadence. Now, a lot of people may not know, and this slide is wrong, um, I apologize for that. That should say September, 2018 to September, 2021, which is now, uh, that is the amount of time that has transpired between the last LTS release. And what do we mean by LTS? Right, so LTS means long-term support and the intermediate releases are called non-LTS or sometimes referred to as short-term support or feature releases. So that's Java 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16 are the non-LTS releases. But the reason why Java 17 is so important is because it is the new long-term support or LTS release since Java 11, uh, which came out in September of three years ago. Okay, so something to keep in mind, right? The idea with non-LTS releases is to introduce features gradually, right? Not all at once. If you remember uh, back in the days of Java 6, 7, and 8, even 9 for that matter, um, what happened is that there were many, many years between the release of those Java versions. So when streams came out, for example, in Java 8, it had been almost five or six years before people had a chance to try out streams in Java and try it out with their code base and see what things needed some minor tweaking and uh, get used to using it. So the idea is that we introduce features gradually so developers can get an idea of what those features look like and provide feedback amongst other things and get ready their code base for the feature as it improves over time. So as you can imagine, aside from that, it's also meant to deliver features faster. And that's also part of the new Java release cadence that has been there in place since Java 11. So as you can imagine, Java has changed quite a bit over those few releases. And what we'll do in this presentation is we'll discuss some of the ways that it has changed some of the new features some of the things that have been deprecated finally, and some of the things that have actually been removed. So for the first time in probably ever, uh, things have actually been removed from Java, right? So we'll briefly touch on those as well. Now, one thing to note, uh, as I mentioned, it's been three years since the last LTS release. And what Oracle has recently proposed actually, uh, at the, around the same time that they did the release of Java 17, was that they want to change the LTS release cadence from three years to two years, okay? So that means that uh, instead of a new LTS coming out every three years, it will come out every two years. And uh, in my opinion, this is a good move because that means that we're able to get the final versions of features faster and it allows us as developers to stay more up to date rather than using things that 
are three years old, uh, we only have to worry about a two year window in which uh, new features and, and removals and fixes and other things have come in. So, but, but let's talk a little bit about how the release and feature cycles work for a few minutes, because I think this is interesting to understand as a Java developer so that you can plan accordingly how to update your Java and how to basically plan around what's available, what are preview features and other things like that. So let's talk about incubator modules. This was introduced with JEP 11. And what this does is it introduces non-final APIs and tools to get developer feedback into the JDK releases. So the important thing on this slide is that these things are non-final. They're often referred to as preview features. That means it's an idea for you as a developer to preview what is there and start playing around with it and starting to understand how you can utilize these features in your code base and get an idea of what's coming, okay? And basically be prepared for when a specific API or a specific feature becomes non-final, then in that specific JDK release, you can start coding for it uh, and putting it out. Of course, you can code for it beforehand, but you just have to be aware that there may be changes to the way that that specific API or feature works, right? So again, it can result in changes or even removal of a specific preview. An example of this was the HTTP2 API, which was introduced in JDK 9, but was made final in JDK 11. So in JDK 10, you could have used the HTTP2 API, but because it was still in preview at that point, there was a possibility that it would have changed in some small or large way, or maybe even completely removed. So this is just something to bear in mind, right? So similarly, you have preview features around this, and this was introduced in JEP 12. And just like API and the different uh, types of language features, um, the idea is that preview features are fully implemented, uh, but may still have some kind of change that it might undergo uh, in subsequent JDK releases until they're deemed to be final, right? And the idea again is that with preview features, we get developer feedback, but it may lead to a permanent feature. And one of the things to note as a developer is that preview features must be enabled with the JVM flag. <laughs> and what does that look like? So for example, we, would say Java C dash dash release version 17 dash dash enable preview. Of course, this inherently means that you must have JDK 17 for this specific example with release 17 to work, but just in general, depending on whichever JDK you have installed and on the path of your computer or server, um, you, could all, you would do Java dash dash enable dash preview to get all the preview features enabled in your specific programming uh, platform, right? Whether you're doing shell or if you're using IntelliJ IDEA or whatever IDE or tools you're using, okay? All right, so one thing to note, there is a small difference between preview APIs and preview language features, right? As I mentioned, one they're called incubators, another called preview features. Preview APIs may be required for preview language feature. Right? And preview APIs are generally part of the Java SE API, either in the Java or Java X namespace. So this is a visual diagram for how I think about this, right? So we have a preview API, which is used by a preview feature, which then both the API and the feature become final in some release of the JDK, okay? So you, you can imagine that with a certain kind of feature, um, there might be some kind of low level API dependence on it. So we have to have the preview API feature, of, we have to have the preview API stuff available so that a, a preview feature can build on that specific API and then eventually both of those become final in a JDK release. And as we go through the presentation, uh, I think you'll see some examples of this 
to uh, how this all actually works as I step through the different versions of the JDK, which is what we're going to do now. We're going to explore some of the uh, releases since JDK 11, and, and we're not going to cover everything because that would take a long time to do. Uh, what we've done is we've picked out uh, some of the nicer features and some of the things that I feel are more applicable for developers in terms of their day-to-day -day usage of the language. So with that said, let's start with JDK 12. Okay, and let's start with switch expressions in JDK 12. All right, so let's think about the old switch statement for a second. So if we think of the old switch statement, there's no result that happens when you use a switch statement. And inside of a switch statement, you need to have a break to break out of the switch statement. And the other problem is that local scoping inside of a switch statement, unfortunately, is not intuitive. So this can be problematic as a developer. Let's have a look at what that looks like in code. Let's say we wanted to write some code where we have a switch that depending on the day of the week counts the number of letters in that actual day. So for example, Monday, Friday, and Sunday have six letters in it, right? And Tuesday had seven, and then Thursday and Saturday have eight, and then Wednesday has nine. And you can, you know, everyone's written a switch statement so you can see what this looks like and how it works. It, you know, then, then we have a default at the bottom which says that uh, if it's not Monday, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, or Sunday, then we should throw an exception saying that that day was not found. Okay, so that's the old switch statement. Now, switch expressions have in, been introduced in JDK 12, and it is different from a statement because if you remember from your programming basics, a statement is something that just executes procedurally some code. An expression is some code that returns a result that you then assign to a variable, okay? And what we can do with this new switch expression on top of the fact that it's an expression and no longer a statement is that we can also combine cases. So let's look at that previous example and see how we can rewrite that using the new switch expression syntax that was introduced in JDK 12. So I'll leave this up for just a second so you can see what it looks like. And as you can see, this is much, much nicer, right? So we say int number of letters equals switch day. So you can see that this is an expression because it's returning a value. In this case, we're going to return an int. And we've also combined the different case labels into single line. So we say case Monday, comma, Friday, comma, Sunday, return a six. You can see we're using almost the functional style arrow that was introduced in Java 8. But if you eyeball this, you can see that if we flip back for just a second, right? So this was our old style switch statement. And this is our new style switch expression. As you can see, this is much, much nicer than what we previously had and again, this was introduced in JDK 12. Okay. Okay, so someone asks, is there a functional interface implemented? Um, we'll look at that a bit later. Uh, I think that Puneet was asked that um, in the update to switch expressions. Uh, and hopefully that will uh, give you a better idea of what that looks like. But the short answer is that there's not really a functional interface even though decided to use the arrow style uh, for the assignment of uh, the case statement's value, okay? All right, also in JDK 12, there was an update to streams. There's a new collector that was added called teeing. And essentially what this is, is this is a merge type of collector that allows you to stream into and merge two upstream collectors using a by function. So what does that look like in practice? Right, it looks like this. So you have a stream, and then you have collector one and two, and then a by function combines and merges those in some way, depending on how you write the by function to get a result. So let's look that look at this in practice. And so say that you wanted to uh, do an average of two numbers. You could stream some numbers right using stream dot of, uh, which that's just part of standard Java, and then you can see dot collect, and then we have teeing in there. 
And then inside of that team, we provide a buy function, which the first one uh, basically just sums the numbers up. The second one counts the numbers. And then we have a functional expression, sum comma n, arrow sum slash n, which if you recognize that algorithm, if you will, uh, what it's doing is it's basically uh, just taking the, the sum and then dividing it by n or getting an average. But you can see how we use the teeing operator here to essentially take two streams and then uh, apply some code to both of those and produce a result from it, okay? So if you remember, this is what the basic idea of teeing is, right? You have two collectors and then you have a buy function that operates on each value in uh, those twice for two different uh, algorithms or two different bits of code and produces a singular result. Okay, so um, there's also a question that says, are these collectors executing parallelly on the stream? And uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, there is something that was introduced uh, in a later version of the JDK called uh, the Vector API, which unfortunately we don't have time to talk about, but you can go and reference that later. Uh, the Vector API made some improvement in the way that you can do parallelization inside of the JVM. So we'll touch on that a briefly a bit later too. So, but that's an excellent question. All right, so let's talk about JDK 13. JDK 13 included something which is pretty fantastic in my opinion and is overdue, um, which was the text blocks feature inside of Java. And again, this is the preview feature and we'll see how this changed uh, slightly in a later J JDK release. But the idea is that you can use three double quotes and get multi-line strings. So let's have a look at what that looks like. So in the JDK 13 text watch preview, you can now do this. You use three quotes. And of course, as you can imagine, this is handy for generating web pages, right? So if we look at uh, what this does, it just, you know, it's multi-line, prints it out exactly. Now, one thing to note is that when you go and run this, it by default strips out the incidental white space, which is at the beginning. So you can see that even though in our code editor, it is indented over to the right so that it looks visually in the proper place within our code, when it's actually run, it strips out the incidental white space at the beginning of each line. You can also notice that we have three spaces and then we have a new line on the next line. And this is required uh, to get this proper incidental white spacing. And just in general, you wanna put stuff on the next line after the three quotes that you have to start a text block. Now, there are a couple of nuances around this is that if you don't want, right, if you go back to here, you can see that for the incidental white space on the last line where it says in an incidental white space, we have a bunch of spaces between the close HTML tag and the three quotes that are at the end. And you can see that uh, there's basically no new line after this, but say that you do want a new line, <coughs> what you would do is you would move those three double quotes to the next line. And as you can see from the executed example is that it has added an extra line to the end of this, but uh, you can also see that it has preserved the intentional indentation that we have with the incidental white space so that you get the code, the output is formatted exactly like you have it spaced to the first element or the first line to be specific in this case, okay? So uh, we'll come back and visit uh, text blocks uh, again in a few minutes when we talk about a subsequent version of the JDK, right? And again, we're on JDK 13 right now. And the point behind the preview features is to put it out there, let developers try it and provide feedback to the, the Java community process so that changes can be incorporated into that specific API or features. So, from JDK 12, when switch expressions were introduced to JDK 13, there were some changes made 
that allowed a more um, nicer way of, of introducing breaks into switch expressions was done. So what they did, this again is an example of an update to a preview feature. So from 12 to 13, the switch expressions changed. And the only real change was that it now can use yield and not break inside of a switch expression. And they also introduced yield as a restricted keyword. So you don't have to panic if you use yield as a variable inside of your code base, because yield is a, an, a restricted keyword, which is only applicable inside of a switch expression. So if you're using yield in other places, you don't have to go and change it because it is a restricted keyword and not a uh, full keyword in the Java language spec. Now, what does that look like? We go to our previous example and use uh, a switch expression and use yield instead of the arrow. You can see that this is what it looks like. You basically, you don't, uh, you, you just say yield and the value that you wish to return and it will return that value for that specific case block. Okay. All right. So let's move swiftly on to JDK 14 and talk about probably uh, the, the biggest improvement in my opinion and in the opinion of many others since uh, JDK 11, and that is records. So most of you probably heard about this. Uh, so we will take a quick tour of what records look like so you can get an idea of what is in the specification for this. Now, Records are essentially a way of making data objects which have an accessor and a constructor on one line. And when you create a record class, it extends java.lang.record. Let's go have a look at a code example, right? This is not a record. <laughs> this is how we used to build DTOs or Java beans or whatever you want to call them, okay? And we're going to use the case of a point inside of a graph. So we have a private final double X, Y, we have a constructor, and then we have a way of going and getting that specific data using a method, a method call to it, okay? So this is how we used to write simple Java data classes, or you could still write it like this, of course, but with records, this has changed. What we can do is all that code basically becomes one line. So let's flip back for a second to see how we used to write a Java data class, right? So we have, we declare the types of fields that are in it. We have a constructor, and then we have the accessor methods for those. Now, instead of all that, we could just say record point, we specify the type, and that's basically it. Okay, so this is how we create a basic record inside of JDK 14. Now, we also create generic records, record anything of type T, type T, as you can see there, and if we look uh, on the fourth line here, you can see that we're not able to add record fields inside of a record, but we can have a static instance field if we want, like so. So if you want to add an extra field in a record, you have to have it inside of the declaration. So public record circle, double radius, comma, double something else, right? So you can't just go in and add something arbitrarily uh, inside, inside of a record. You can add something when you declare the actual signature of the record itself, but you can add a static instance field as we've seen in this example right here, okay? Now, let's look at some other things around this. Um, records obviously have a, a default canonical instructor constructor that is generated, but you can override that canonical constructor like so. So we could say record tracks in X comma Y and say you needed to do something to initialize that record. You could say public tracks. You can see the signature is exactly the same. And then we have some logic there. So if X is, you know, less than Y, blah, 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 uh, do some stuff. But uh, when you create a canonical constructor, you do need to do a this.x equals x and this.y equals y, i.e. do a, the assignment from the passed in variables to the, the internal variables that rec 
reference uh, the fields. Okay, now this is a little messy. So there is an idea of a compact constructor, right? So at the top, we are using a canonical constructor, which everyone is familiar with. But if you look at the second one, you'll see that we have record range, int low, comma, int high. And then you, we just say public range, and then the, the low and high are inferred. And you can see we just do a quick check to say if low is greater than high, then throw an exception or whatever, right? So it, we've just added some uh, business logic into the constructor. But in this case, we're using what's called a compact constructor rather than the canonical constructor or the old school style constructor that you're probably used to, okay? Now, let's say that you need to do some more stuff um, around the constructor. You can also throw an exception by using that uh, standard type constructor that we saw before. Uh, in this case, you can see we have a checked exceptions um, for how this works. Yeah. So, um, yeah. right, so yeah. you, if your record needs to throw uh, an exception, this is how you would do it. You would use the canonical constructor uh, to be able to do this. And there's an interest, interesting question from Panit. He says, are records replacements for POJOs? And uh, the answer is yes and no, right? In my opinion, um, records are a replacement for what we would traditionally call Java beans or data access objects or just data objects in general. But it's not necessarily a replacement for POJOs because a lot of people use POJOs for things aside from just holding data, right? So records are meant to hold data just like data access objects are, right? Or data objects are. Um, so if you have a lot of business logic, you would not necessarily put that into a record. One thing to note is that records are also immutable, but the immutability is shallow. So that means if your record contains some kind of object field inside of it, the reference to that object cannot be changed, but the underlying object, you know, if it's, let's say it's a point object um, that is contained within some larger shape object or something like that, uh, then that sub object can be changed. So it's a shallow immutability, not a deep immutability. However, saying that, one thing that's interesting about records is if a record contains another record, then yes, everything is immutable because your entire kind of object tree uh, for your for that specific record, right? If a record contains a record as a field, since both are immutable, they will both be immutable. Okay. So, and uh, someone uh, Pritesh says, "Is this similar to a tuple?" The answer is yes. It is actually a tuple. Okay. So, if you're familiar with that term, it is definitely a tuple. Um, and somebody else, Nita says, "Is Lumbach dead?" Uh, that is a good question. Um, Lumbach is a little bit of a polarizing um, project or tool in the Java universe. Uh, I personally like to use Lumbach, but I have friends who I respect who don't like to use Lumbach for a variety of reasons. Uh, so I understand uh, what Nita is trying to ask. Uh, the short answer is that maybe you don't need to use Lumbach with Java records anymore. Okay, and uh, someone else said, actually, I was thinking that we wouldn't need Lumbach anymore. Uh, but the reason why I said maybe is exactly what Michael said. Uh, Lumbach actually does much more than just provide data objects. Um, and there is a vast variety of const uh, a vast variety of different annotations within Lumbach that help you do more things besides data objects. So, yes, all excellent questions. Thank you for asking them. Okay, one more thing. Um, if we use a default constructor, uh, when, when and we sorry, if you use the compact constructor inside of a record when you uh, create it, uh, don't forget that you have to run a this to go and go set those variables uh, to make sure that the data is set accordingly to the internal fields on a record. Okay. All right. So a couple more things. Let's go have a look to see how, if we wanted to have extra things passed in, but not stored as a field, 
the way that you could do this is you could use a canonical or standard constructor. And then you can see we have a this x comma y there to set the internal fields. But you can see that the record declaration on the first line is slightly different than the constructor declaration on the second line. So that's what you're doing in this case is you're saying, I want a constructor with three things passed in, but I actually only need two fields in the record, x comma y. I don't really need z uh, to be stored, but I might need it to do some validation or do some computation. Uh, so we can do that uh, like so, okay? Um, and, and this is a complete example where you have an exception and you're using a, a canonical constructor with uh, a more arguments or parameters than the record would normally take. And um, you can see that we do some checking and we set the uh, X and Y to the internal value of the fields, or we just pass it up to the default constructor for it to set it, okay? All right, so if we're again going to the default constructor or sorry, the so this is the canonical and this is the compact constructor, um, we still want to, go and set the, or, or invoke the, um, invoke the default constructor uh, by doing a this two comma three so that the fields get set appropriately. Okay, so let's, talking, let's talk a bit about using instance of, right? So uh, remember Java is an object oriented language uh, and there's this new feature called pattern matching uh, based on instance of, and it uses something called flow scoping. So let's get into this for a bit. And again, this is JDK 14. JDK 14, uh, in my view, was the, the release that introduced the most number of uh, features uh, since 11. So you probably have done this before, where you say, if object instance of string, go and do something with it. In this case, go and print out the length of the string, right? But we have this instance of here, and it can be a little bit annoying that we have to do this quite a bit in our code base. So the pattern matching instance of preview introduced this new way of essentially doing an inline quote unquote pattern match of instance of. Now this isn't pattern match matching in terms of the way that we're normally used to thinking about it using like, you know, regular expression or something like that. What it does is it, it allows us to say, in this case, if object is an instance of string, we introduce this new almost variable name here called s, and then we say system.outprintline s.length. So let's flip back a bit and have a look at the, the, the difference. So what this is doing is this is doing an, an implicit cast from what we're doing the check of the instance of from, right? So we say object instance of string, if that's true, then we do a cast of object to a string and then we're able to go and call the string methods on it. But you can see that this is a little bit nicer and is a little bit more expressive in terms of how we actually write this code, right? So we can just say if object instance of string, then we give it a temporary variable and then we don't have to do a cast anymore. And of course, in this specific case, because of the scoping, um, the else statement will not have S inside scoped inside of it because it just doesn't make sense. Right, because if uh, if the object is not an instance of string s, then we don't need to use that s. We would just use obj to reference that thing to do something else with it. Right. <coughs> okay. Let's look into this a little bit more. Let's say that we want to do some kind of additional check. We say if object instance of string s and s dot length is greater than zero, then go do something. Right? And this works because we're using an ampersand ampersand or logical and. So as you know, in, in Java, well, almost every programming language, when you do a logical and, the, the left side must evaluate true before you even execute the right side of a, a logical and. So hence why this is possible. Right? Let's dig into this a little bit more and if we use an or expression, right, and we say in the last one, object instance of string s or s dot length is greater than zero, that will give you a compiler error because in a logical or, both sides of the logical or have to be executed 
for it to uh, be able to pass the, uh, the, the ore test. But as you can imagine, this is not allowed as you have to do the instance of S first. So you would have to essentially do a uh, embedded if to be able to do that. Uh, you're not able to go and string two different uh, tests for the pattern match of the instance of in this case. Okay. So one thing to remember, of course, is that we're using flow scoping here. So we can say that uh, we're able to scope inside of the instance of uh, block uh, as we've done previously. So that um, in this case, if we say, if uh, O is not an instance of string, then we just return, but that S is available subsequently because we have the specific logic that says that if it's not that, then put it into scope. Okay, so that's what flow scoping means in this case. All right, so as mentioned before, as we go from different versions of the JDK and there is a preview API or, or a preview feature, there is the very high possibility that as long as the feature is in the preview state, then there can be changes to it. And we need to be aware of that as we're coding, that there may be change to a preview feature uh, until that feature is deemed to be final in some way. Okay, so one of those changes was the text block were changed slightly as the team that works on these features on the Java team uh, got developer feedback. So essentially what they did is they added um, a couple of new escape sequences, a slash for at end of line and a slash S for trailing spaces. So let's see what that looks like. It's easier to explain in code, okay? So two new escape sequences, right? So say that you want everything to be on one line, you can use almost the shell script style of the slash. So this line will not slash contain a new line in the middle, blah, 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 right? So you can guess what this does. If you've ever written a shell script, the slash means basically this is not a line break. Uh, I've just made this line break here for readability purposes. So this will be one single line. And then the other thing, as you can see in the, the second example here is that if you actually do want the white space not stripped at the end of a line, what you do is you use a slash S and that will tell the Java runtime to preserve up to where that slash S is the actual white space. Okay, so a couple of different things there in terms of how you deal with uh, white spacing inside of a text block. All right, so let's quickly reference JEP 393, which is the FAR Memory Access API. I don't want to go into too much detail on this uh, because this is actually uh, a topic all into itself. And if, if you're interested in this, there's a recording of this by uh, my colleague, uh, Carl D who talked about Project Panama in detail. So the Farm Memory Access API is part of the Project Panama uh, set of features, which is meant to be a replacement of JNI. If you're not familiar with JNI, JNI is a way for Java to call down into native code and native libraries, right? And this is an example of an API enabling a new feature. So the Farm Memory Access API enables everything that's in Project Panama, which is a new way of accessing uh, native libraries because JNI has been for many, many years, a very confusing and uh, frustrating way of calling into native libraries from Java. So they finally addressed that with Panama. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, my colleague has a nice presentation on Project Panama, which uh, is also part of the Fuji tour. So if you all wanna do it here, uh, contact Yershon and he can uh, get that lined up also. So anyways, um, we already looked at this. I'm sorry, I don't know where that slide came from. Um, the, the other nice thing that was introduced in this JDK was the helpful null pointer exception. If you're familiar with how null pointer exceptions work, uh, if you did a.b.c.i equals 99 and anything, the b, c, or i was null, I'm sorry, the a, b, or c was null, you would get the first exceptions that printed, which is basically no pointer except, exception on that line. 
Unfortunately, that's not very useful because is A no, is B no, or is C no? Right, so what was introduced as part of this is a, a more detailed no pointer exception message, which you can see in the second exception, it says cannot read field C because A dot B is null. So that basically tells you that, well, B is null, right? The, the annoying thing about this feature, unfortunately, is that you have to explicitly enable it, at least currently, by adding this flag to your Java runtime, right? It's dash XX colon plus show code details and exception messages, which, which I think is actually the longest flag that you can pass to a Java runtime. I don't think I've seen a longer one, but anyways, uh, you do have to explicitly enable it. I'm not sure why they didn't uh, enable it or have it enabled by default. It might be because uh, there are a lot of, um, of tools that use log scraping to be able to get, uh, you know, to, to be able to do stuff, right? Uh, everyone has probably written some kind of Java log scraper to watch for certain kinds of exceptions. So maybe that's why they didn't enable it by default uh, because people have written tools that scrape Java logs or look at Java logs in runtime to do error reporting or, you know, whatever. Um, but you do have to ex uh, in explicitly enable it to use this feature. But I think this is really nice and handy because now I don't have to turn on a debugger or write like extra, extra test cases to be able to isolate when this kind of error does occur. I can just look at it and I know exactly where the error is when we do uh, some kind of chain access uh, to objects. Okay. All right, so let's move swiftly on from JDK 14 to JDK 15, All right? So the major thing that was introduced in JDK 15 was this concept of sealed classes. Now, what does sealed classes actually mean? Let's have a look at this to get a better idea. Okay, move forward. All right, so this was introduced in JEP 360. And what sealed classes allows you to do is give you control over what can be subclassed. It has to be in the same module or package, and the method signature looks like public sealed class shape. I'm just making up that uh, class call shape permits dot, dot, dot. We'll look at that in just a second, right? But again, remember that it has to be in the same module or package, and the idea is that it allows you to control who or what can subclass something. So let's say we have a class called shape, and then we have subclasses, triangle, square, and pentagon. If we were in standard Java, anybody could subclass shape unless you mark shape as final, in which case nobody could subclass shape, okay? Which obviously is not the perfect solution. That's what zero classes fix. So for example, you could create, you could say public sealed class shape permits triangle, square, and pentagon. And so if you created a, tried to create a subclass called circle that extends shape, you would get an error because in the seal class, only things which are explicitly permitted using the permits keyword are allowed to extend or subclass that specific class. Okay. So there's some interesting nuances around this. Um, right, all subclasses must have inheritance capabilities explicitly specified. So uh, we can restrict subclasses to a defined set of different things, as we see in the, the first line of code, public seal class triangle permits those things, but extend shape, right? So we can restrict subclasses to a defined set in this case. The second code example um, is we prevent any Further subclassing, right? So we say public final class square extends shape in this specific case so that the subclass cannot be extended anymore, right? And of course, uh, if we want to unseal a class, we are able to do that. We could say public non sealed class Pentagon extends shape, right? So that means we can reopen the subclass, but remember that everything needs to be 
within the same package or the same module for the uh, the ceiling to or the ceiling rules that we've talked about to be applicable. All right. So as I mentioned before, preview features are able to be updated uh, until until they are deemed to be final. And so the records was also updated in this version of the JDK. So the main thing that was done is that there's this concept of local records now. Okay. So it's almost like a local class and it is implicitly static. So let's look at this example, right? So we have list seller, uh, find top sellers. And then inside of this find top sellers method, we declare a new record that we're only going to use inside of this method, right? So you can see, I'm not gonna walk through all the code here because what we, what we care about for this specific code block is the way that we have declared a record inside of a method rather than at the class level. So in some ways, some ways, this is like almost like an anonymous inner class, but we have a named record inside of a method. And then we can go and use that record to hold some data as we do some computation in this case, we're basically going and extracting, uh, or I, I should say, inserting a object called seller into a sales record. And then we're using that to do some functional Java style programming or coding uh, to apply an algorithm to go and get the top sellers essentially out of, or I'm sorry, to sort all the, the, the sellers uh, in terms of their sales. Uh, by storing the, the data inside of an encapsulated sales record object, okay? <coughs> All right, let's move forward. Okay, and of course, these new features often go hand in hand or a new API or new feature is incorporated into another new API or feature and one of those things is records working with sealed classes. So we can create a public sealed interface car, permits or red car, blue car, et cetera. And then we can create a record from that. We say public record, red car, implements car, public record, blue car, implements car, right? So we we're using a sealed interface to go and limit the classes that can implement this interface. And in this case, those classes are records. So here you can see some of the new features in JDK 11 working together, namely sealed classes and records. Remember, records are just another type of class. When you create a record, it's, it's actually implementing java.lang.record as its base class, okay? All right, so let's get to Java 16. We're slowly getting to Java 17. And actually, Java 16 didn't really have a lot of things inside of it, right? So uh, the main things that Java 16 did was that it made the pattern matching that we have been discussing so far and the record stuff that we've been discussing so far. It took it out of preview mode and it made it final. So that means now you can use the pattern matching stuff and records with the knowledge that they will not be changing from this point onwards, okay? So the other thing is that it added um, the two list to streams and it added something called period of day, all right? The other things that were added in JDK 16 were the vector API, but note, this is not the vector class, it's the vector API. This is essentially a way of allowing parallelization of code within Java to get performance, more parallelizable performance. Uh, again, it's not the vector class, it's a vector API. And I'm not gonna go into detail on it because uh, I think it is useful in certain use cases, um, but it's not something that most people would generally use unless they're building some kind of high performance uh, computation stuff in Java. For example, if you work in financial services or if you work in scientific computing, 
it is interesting, but it would take a while to explain. Uh, so I just at least wanted to mention that you can have a look at the vector API if you work in an area that requires parallelizable or high performance computation in Java. Okay. The other thing that JDK 16 introduced was the JEP 389 or the Foreign Linker API, which again is part of Project Panama, which is the new way of accessing native code and native libraries in Java. Again, Project Panama. And it's a Panama presentation was an hour by itself. So we're not going to jump into that here. Um, so those are the major things in 16. Pattern matching and records final. There's a new two list and stream. There's a period of day thing for working with time. And these three things that we just talked about. So let's move on to JDK 17 and see what's in here. Now, we have pattern matching for switch. So here's another example where we have two new APIs or features where they are working together. So a switch is typically limited on what type you can use. And this can be a little annoying sometimes. As a Java developer, it's like, why can't I just use this to, to do a switch statement? Now with pattern matching, uh, it gives us a little bit more expansive capabilities. Right, so it, it expands the allow, uh, expanded to allow type of patterns to be matched. So if we have a look at this, you'll see we say switch O. If the case is null, which I think this is really handy, say go and do this. If it's a string, then cast it to a string and then go and do this. If it's a color or a type of color, Right, go and do this, et cetera, et cetera. I think this is actually really, really handy, if nothing else, for the ability to do a null check directly inside of a switch statement, right? So um, the, the, the switch statement and the expression can now use the pattern matching stuff that we talked about, i.e., where we would normally do an instance of to check to see what kind of object something is. We can do this directly inside of a switch statement. And I think this is one of the most uh, interesting and useful features in JDK 17 or just in Java in general in the last few years. I think uh, having the ability to work with types in this uh, flexible way or do specifically to do type matching and testing in this specific way is actually very, very useful in uh, a practical sense. I think everybody has done some variation of this in a lot more code. Okay. All right, so if we want to look at um, a slightly, you know, more complete example of this, right? We can also say that if the pattern matching, for instance, of in a switch does not match something, we can have a default uh, to have some kind of uh, proper exit out of this in case there is no match. And then um, if we wanted to, uh, you know, just instead of using an object as the base here, if we wanted to use, for example, the seal class as an example, we could check switch shape, triangle, square, and pentagon uh, for shape. But, but notice if we use a sealed class inside of this pattern match for a switch statement, we don't need a default. Why don't we need a default? if we're using a sealed class as the base for the switch expression. Because a sealed class can only have a finite number of defined types, right? If you remember a sealed class, you say a sealed class can only be extended by these classes specifically. So in the case of shape, we said that the shape sealed class can only have a triangle, square, and Pentagon subclass, and no other subclasses can exist for this class. So when we use a seal class as part of a pattern match for a switch expression, we know exactly the number of different types which are possible for it. So there's no need for a default because there can only be these three things. It can never be something else besides these three because it is a seal class and we have explicitly stated that there are only these kinds of subtypes for it, okay? All right, so along with uh, what we've seen for the instance of uh, pattern match previously, 
we can also do some garden pattern matching. So uh, if you look at the highlighted area in this specific example, we say case triangle T and and T dot area is greater than 25. I think, again, this is really nice because it allows the Java developer to write more expressive code on less lines of code. What we would have to do in the past is we would have to write a separate uh, case statement and have an if block and et cetera, et cetera, and it would probably get a little messy. In this case, we can just say if it's triangle and execute this method in a triangle, if the area of it is greater than 25, then say it's a big triangle or it's a small triangle, right? But you can see the guarded pattern here is we say, what's the primary pattern, i.e., does the instance of match this specific type and then have a conditional end expression attached to it? Okay. All right. So we're almost near the end here. Uh, let's talk about some of the things that were removed from the Java universe in JDK 17. So this is something that's new for us because typically in the Java universe, we do not see things actually getting removed. What we see is things just get deprecated. Lots and lots and lots of things just get deprecated, right? And this can be um, uh, kind of, um, it's kind of nice in a way because if you've written code 10 or 15 years ago, like I did, uh, you can sleep good at night because you know that your code will always run up until now. But it is nice that things are getting removed. And the reason why I think it's nice is because it helps to keep the Java language and the JVM runtime as small as possible, which I feel is important in this cloud universe that we live in now. Right? Everyone on this call probably runs some kind of Java application on the cloud, if not all their Java apps on the cloud. And you know, we put stuff into a Docker container and we run in a cloud type of uh, a restricted environment, whether it's a VPS or whether it's Kubernetes or OpenShift or whatever. So it's nice that things are getting removed because now we can have a more, what I like to call lean and mean Java runtime. Okay, so for example, in JDK 17, um, or leading up to JDK 17, uh, the CMS garbage collector was removed. What you would use instead of the CMS, the concurrent mark and sweep garbage collector, is you use the G1 garbage collector, or you can step up to a um, professional grade a garbage collector, which is Azul Prime. As I mentioned before, Azul Prime is 37% uh, faster, uh, for example, in the Java Renaissance test. And if you use uh, Neo4j, um, Azul Prime can run uh, the Neo4j query and analytics 167% faster, et cetera, et cetera. So anyways, uh, JDK 14 removed uh, the CMS GC. Uh, JDK, I'm sorry, that was 14. JDK 17 removed the experimental AOT and JIT compilers that were previously introduced, I believe in JDK 9. Um, and, uh, they were introduced originally for work on Graal VM, uh, which some of you may be familiar with, uh, but this is an Oracle Labs project. But uh, they basically decided that it wasn't necessary to keep those experimental AOT and JIT compilers around, um, so they were removed. So uh, the other thing that is kind of a big deal, but not really, is that the security manager has been deprecated for future removal. Now, this may sound like it makes Java less secure, but actually it doesn't. The security manager is a relic from our days of writing Java applets inside, embedded inside of a web browser, believe it or not. So the Java security manager is actually not really used in real world non-applet scenarios. And I don't think there's a lot of people still writing applets today anyways, okay? All right, so almost on the home stretch here. All right, so um, JDK 7 did finalize some internal JDK APIs. Um, so JDK 9 introduced encapsulation of internal JDK APIs, um, which means that certain things uh, like java.mist.unsafe um, were now encapsulated. In JDK 16, the default became to deny access to those uh, 
encapsulated in internal JDK APIs that you are not supposed to use. And then in JDK 17, uh, they basically uh, made it so that you can no longer access those internal JDK APIs. However, some exceptions were made. For example, for Java. Uh, uh, sorry, sun.misc.unsafe is still available. Okay, but most of the internal APIs, if you're using them in your code, are no longer even accessible with JDK 17. But with JDK 16, you were able to uh, allow usage of those by setting a flag. In JDK 17, they're not even usable anymore. As a for for most Java developers, maybe 99.99% of Java developers, you don't care about this because you don't use internal uh, Sun or JDK uh, APIs anyways. Okay, so <clears throat> let's talk about the different versions of the JDK. Um, you can use the Azul Zulu builds of OpenJDK, which are again, 100% free um, and open source. Uh, they're fully TCK tested. So that's one of the unique things is that um, uh, Azul Zulu JDKs of the OpenJDK versions are uh, fully TCK or test kit compliant tested for JDKs version 6, 7, 8, 11, 13, and 15 available on many platforms. And of course, the drop-in replacement for Oracle JDKs or uh, any other JDK for that matter. Okay, so finally, a few words. Um, the six month release cycle seems to be working well by allowing Java developers uh, early access, let's say, or preview access to these features. It gives us Java developers the ability to go check out things like records and to try out things like switch expressions and to start thinking about planning how we will start using this in our code base, um, whether we're refactoring things or we're writing new code. Okay, so it seems to be going well. It, it allows us to have new Java features and releases and enhancements faster, which in my opinion is a good thing, right? And it, because of this release cycle, Java is adding features to give developers great ways to code faster. OK, uh, there is a bunch of stuff that we didn't cover, uh, for example, Project Panama and the new vector API and things like that. So this was not an exhaustive uh, cataloging of all of the different types of features, API changes and other things in uh, JDK 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 and 17. So just be aware of that. OK, and with that, um, we will start. Um, actually, there, there was uh, PD mentions that is there a replacement for, for Nash Horn in Java 17? So yes, you are correct. That's one thing I did not mention is that Nash Horn, which was the JavaScript interpreter that was built into Java for a long time, was removed in JDK 17. And the short answer to your question is, I do not know if there's a replacement for Nash Horn in Java 17. I think you can still use Nash Horn in Java 17 by simply uh, pulling in uh, the library for it, but I am not familiar with that specific thing. Okay, so with that, uh, I'm going to stop sharing. And uh, did we stop sharing? Yep. Okay. I'm going to stop sharing and uh, take some questions uh, or some comments. Uh, I will also reiterate that if you are in Singapore and you wish to be uh, entered into the um, a prize giveaway for a $50 gift card. Uh, I'll put the URL again inside of um, the, the Zoom chat here. Okay. All right. So any questions or comments on the various different topics that we've talked about? Oh. Okay, so there's another question uh, right about the ZGC garbage collector. Is it going to be available as well? I believe ZGC is still available, but I think a larger question is, why do you want to use GC? Uh, you're better off uh, using the, um, let me go double check. Uh, there, there were things, you know, like I said, they, the CMS removed, uh, I, typically nowadays you want to use uh, the G1 garbage collector, uh, but but I, I will say that there are certain use cases where G, ZGC might be better, 
I don't know. Uh, but uh, uh, PD, who's the person who asked that question, uh, if you want to get in touch with me um, uh, over Twitter or by email or something, um, uh, please let me know what your specific use case is for ZGC. And uh, we can have a discussion about it. And I might be able to give you some more insight or information on uh, what is a good replacement for that. So, OK, uh, more uh, questions or comments? Doesn't look like we have any more, so. Okay. Final call. Going once for yeah. questions or comments. Going twice. I actually have one, 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 one more question. Actually, maybe I'll just. Uh, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, you can uh, say it. It's fine. Uh, like you know, uh, generally, like uh, we always see use cases where you know we have to build some like low latency sort of an apps and stuff like that. And you, I, I remember you were mentioning something about that as well. So, is there any any features or anything that you wanna like talk about or just give some uh, details about so that we can go and refer to about what is that feature about in J all these recent versions of Java or probably explore this GC and this can help you out to you know. Yeah, yeah. So, so you're specifically mentioning low latency applications, right? Yeah. Um, so uh, the 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 vector API is one of them. Um, that is good for uh, doing concurrent computation, um, and uh, that does not necessarily factor into uh, the garbage collector strategy. Um, there is a I'm trying to, unfortunately, I can't remember. It's, it's way too early in the morning for me, so I can't remember. Uh, there is another garbage collector that was introduced, um, I think, in in Java 11 or 12. I think I think it was in 11, actually. Um, I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head. Uh, but, but that garbage collector was aimed specifically at doing more parallelization uh, inside of the um, of the JVM, uh, but uh, I'm trying to think in terms of pure language features. Um, I think records are good because they're essentially a built-in way of having a D DTO type of object, so that will definitely affect garbage collection. Um, I think the fact that those objects are immutable will also have an impact on garbage collection. But of course, you, you'd have to have millions upon millions of those objects for it really to make a difference in the garbage collection um, a strategy around it. Um, well, one of the nice things about working in Java is that um, the, the garbage collector has gotten much, much better uh, just in every uh, release, uh, you know, like with the CMS and then the G1, uh, and then their commercial garbage collectors, which are part of, for example, Azul Prime, um, which make it, uh, you know, Azul Prime has a, a, a nearly real-time uh, no latency garbage collector. So uh, that's something that's worth checking out, of course. Um, but in terms of the other code type of things, um, I think one thing that I would be careful of is using uh, the text blocks. Um, well, when I say careful is I think you would, I feel like using a text block because you know when we do strings, strings take up a lot of space inside of the heap. So uh, I feel like a text block would probably have a positive impact on low latency and garbage collection, but I haven't run any tests to verify that, right? That's just my feeling. So um, the one thing I do wish that was introduced was some kind of string interpolation along with text blocks. Because I think that you know, it, everyone has done this where you say string A plus string B plus string C. And like, you know, we have it all over the place. And it, it looks, uh, at least from just a developer's perspective, it looks very messy. And I don't like messy things as a developer. Um, so I wish they would have introduced string interpolation uh, along with text blocks. Maybe they'll do that in a subsequent release of the JDK. But where I'm going with this in terms of performance is that if they had the ability inside of just straight Java code to do uh, inline string interpolation, I believe that there could have been some uh, essentially either uh, JIT-based or GC-based optimizations applied 
to a built-in string interpolation type of methodology or feature that would improve the ability for low latency and garbage collection for those interpolated string types. I, I, I mean, I'm going kind of deep here. Hopefully you understood what I was trying to say, right? But a built-in uh, string interpolation feature, I think would give the designers of garbage collectors and also people who design optimizations the ability to apply uh, immediate and long-term JIT optimizations that would have a really good impact on reducing latency and helping garbage collection be more efficient is what I'm trying to get at. But that feature does not exist today. So we're just talking, <laughs> we're just speculating and having some fun right now. <laughs> okay. Sure. Okay. I mean, thanks for the details so far. Yeah. Yep. So uh, any more questions? I think we're almost at time. So, uh, and also uh, to Puneet and the Singapore uh, Java user group uh, members, uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, as I was saying, when we first started, uh, hopefully we'll be able to do this in person sometime next year uh, instead of over Zoom. Sure. I mean, thanks for taking us. It really, uh, it was a pleasure listening to the session, really enjoyed it. And I think our members would have learned quite a bit, even myself as well. So thanks to you. Thanks, Ketujan, for uh, you know, helping with this. And I really appreciate all of you. So, yeah, uh, happy to have you here for the new sessions as well. So let's just uh, keep we'll do more the topics as well. So, yeah, get yeah for sure. Yeah. So, thanks, Pratik. Okay. Great. Thanks. Have a good evening or good morning. So, good afternoon, everybody, wherever you come. Good morning to you. Bye-bye. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.